Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Barbara Johnson and I am board chair for the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies. For those of you who are new to the Joint Center, the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, known as America's Black Think Tank, provides compelling and actionable policy solutions to eradicate persistent and evolving barriers to the full freedom of Black people in America. We are the trusted forum for leading experts and scholars to participate in major public policy debates and promote ideas that advance Black communities. Today, we are here to talk about the challenges and solutions to expanding broadband in the Black rural South and policy recommendations to expand home internet in the region. The Black rural South represents 152 rural communities spread across 10 states with populations that are 35% Black or higher in the Southern region of the United States. As we have witnessed during COVID, the pandemic has exacerbated the digital divide and access to affordable, reliable broadband continues to be an urgent need for all Americans. According to a recent Pew Research Center survey, Black and Hispanic adults in the United States remain less likely than white adults to say they own a traditional computer or have high-speed internet at home. As the late Congressman John Lewis said, access to the internet is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Before we get started on our panel discussion, I want to introduce our esteemed panelists, and then I will turn it over to Dominique to talk about the report and to moderate the discussion. We are so fortunate to be joined by Congressman James E. Clyburn, who needs no introduction. You should all know him as the majority whip and the third ranking Democrat in the United States House of Representatives. He represents South Carolina's sixth congressional district, and he is chair of the House Democratic Rural Broadband Task Force. Next is former FCC chairwoman Mignon Clyburn. She is the first chairwoman and former commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission and former commissioner of the South Carolina Public Service Commission. Currently, she is an independent consultant and principal of MLS Strategies, where she provides strategic advice and critical solutions in the technology, media, telecommunications, and investor-owned utility industries. Next, we have Francella Ochillo, who is executive director of Next Century Cities, where she works to elevate the voices of local officials who are working to expand high-speed connectivity. An attorney and digital rights advocate, Francella has worked on a variety of technology and telecommunications issues with a specific focus on assessing the impact of policy proposals on unserved and underserved communities. Then we have FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks of the Federal Communications Commission. Commissioner Starks has been a champion for millions of Americans who lack access to or who cannot afford a home internet connection. As a native Kansan, he understands the communications needs of rural America. Before he was appointed commissioner, Mr. Starks helped lead the FCC's Enforcement Bureau. And finally, Dr. Dominique Harrison. She is director of the Technology Policy Program for the Joint Center, where she leads a program dedicated to exploring the impact of emerging technologies and developing policy solutions to improve the lives of Black communities. To all of our panelists, welcome. And to you, our audience, if you have any questions you would like to ask our panelists, 
please drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Let us know who you are and your affiliation. Now, I will turn it over to Dr. Harrison to lead, lead us off with a discussion of her report. Thank you so much, Barbara. It is a pleasure to be on this panel and I am so excited to talk about our forthcoming report, Affordability and Availability, Expanding Broadband in the Black Rural South, which will be available soon on jointcenter.org. So to better understand the rural black belt, the Joint Center examined rural counties with populations that are 35% black or higher. Black people collectively make up 49.2% of the region's population and narrowly edge out white people as the largest racial group. We collected this original data in order to isolate counties that were clearly part of the black belt to understand the region's distinctive characteristics relative to other parts of the nation. In our research, we discovered that 38% of African Americans in the Black Rural South lack home internet access. And this is driven by both the lack of affordability and availability of broadband services. High speed broadband is not available to some households because the service has not been deployed in the area by an internet service provider or in communities where high speed broadband infrastructure is available, some low income households lack access because the service is not affordable. Too often, national broadband conversations focused on rural America conflate rural with white and rarely give attention to the unique plight of black residents of rural communities. For the Joint Center, we understand that African Americans' lack of access to broadband is a problem in both metropolitan and rural areas. And today, we want to uplift the opportunity to connect more residents in the black rural South as the infrastructure debate continues. So I want to open up the discussion to our panelists. Thank you all again for being here. First, I want to start off with Congressman James Clyburn. Thank you so much for being on our panel today. Congressman James Clyburn, can you give us a quick overview of what is happening with the bipartisan infrastructure package as it relates to investments for broadband expansion? Well, thank you very much for having me. I suspect that all of you are the uh, tune into C-SPAN, the least C-SPAN 2, uh, and you know that uh, within the last couple of hours, uh, things have begun to occur in the Senate. They are uh, currently uh, trying to proceed uh, with these negotiations, uh, and uh, th that vote, I suspect, will be over uh, soon, and we'll know where they're going. But my uh, activity has been to coordinate with the bipartisan group in the Senate uh, to make sure that whatever they do include what we have been pushing, uh, which we call the accessible, affordable broadband for all legislation. As you know, it's a $95 billion bill uh, Senator Amy Klobuchar has been moved, pushing that bill on the Senate side. We'll see uh, what they do with the bipartisan bill, uh, and then uh, we'll know uh, where to go from there. So if they uh, were to proceed with the vote, uh, I'm sure they got the votes to pass it. Uh, we'll see what's left on the table, uh, so we'll know how to proceed. In subsequent, with subsequent legislation. Because as I understand it, the bill uh, that they're voting on, or that they may vote on, they're trying to get the deal on, is a $65 billion bill, uh, which is 30 billion short of where we think it ought to be. Thank you so much, Congressman. Um, in our report, we talk about the unique challenges facing black communities in the black rural South. When you think about your constituents, what are you hearing about the lack of broadband services in South Carolina? Look, as you can imagine, um, COVID-19 uh, reveals some significant, um, let's just say significant disrepair uh, that exists. Some of you may have heard me say, I often talk about Alexis de Tocqueville's notion when he wrote his book, a two volume work, Democracy in America. And the Tokyo said America is not great because it's more enlightened than any other nation, but rather because it has always been able to repair its faults. 
Well, some fault lines were open to COVID-19 and no place is that more pronounced than in the lack of broadband. Because of the lack of connectivity, I think you indicate on the 38% of black communities in the rural uh, South are connected uh, to the broadband. Well, uh, high-speed broadband is what is needed if we're gonna have healthcare uh, to be effectively delivered. You cannot have good healthcare uh, without uh, telehealth and telemedicine. And I can tell you this, we in certain places in the South, we're gonna see our children lose a second year of school. There's a fourth surge now uh, coming about. It's in uh, basically uh, states like Louisiana and South Carolina and Georgia and Florida, uh, the Southern states. And if that were to happen, we'll see some children losing another year of school. And I need not tell you what happens uh, to an eighth and ninth grader if they are out of school for two years. So we cannot have a continued education for our young people, continued connection to education by them uh, without broadband. Broadband to me uh, is to the South today where the electricity was in the 20th century. Thank you so much, Congressman, especially those important topics around education and health. I wanna turn it over to Commissioner Jeffrey Starks. Commissioner Starks, millions of Americans don't have access to broadband, either because it's not available or, or they can't afford it. And this is the case for black residents in the black rural South. The emergency broadband benefit was developed to help families and households struggling to afford internet service during the COVID-19 pandemic, but it is only temporary. Can you share your perspectives on what lawmakers must address to expand low cost internet for low income Americans? Yes, well, uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for allowing me to be here uh, today. Yeah, and of course, we're all watching the Olympics and I feel like I'm on, on a great team here with this panel today. And so um, honored to join this August group as well. Uh, you know, first, congratulations, of course, to you and your colleagues there at the Joint Center for the tremendous work that you all are doing on several fronts, including especially tech policy, uh, as you all work to center and power those voices that, been at the, that have been at the margins. And the focus on broadband policy has never been more important. And so uh, from Mark Morial, Joy Cheney, uh, there at the National Urban League with their Lewis Latimer plan, uh, to Robert Smith, uh, to, of course, my predecessor on the commission who joins us here today, Commissioner Clyburn. There have never been so many powerful leaders, public and private sector, who are coalesced around this issue. And so, as you just heard from, uh, from the whip, uh, as he stated, every person in this country deserves access to high quality, affordable broadband. Uh, and it was Congressman John Lewis who said access to the Internet is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. And why is that? It's because it impacts nearly all of the fundamental aspects of our lives, our ability to access healthcare through telemedicine, education, as you just heard uh, the whip say, good paying jobs as well. For those small businesses, their ability to continue to sustain themselves, get their legs back underneath them. Oh, and by the way, even registering to vote in 40 states can be done online. So this is absolutely crucial. And so I've long said, to bring the benefits of broadband to every American, policymakers need to focus on the three pillars of digital inclusion. That's first, expanding broadband infrastructure, as we just heard. The second really is to ensure that broadband is affordable for all. And then the third, of course, is to continue to empower Americans with digital skills. And so to quickly lean in on the affordability aspect that you talked about. You know, as your report states, Dr. Harrison, 38% of black people living in, that, in the black rural South don't have broadband. And that's driven by both affordability and access. So nearly two in five people, it's incredibly troubling, uh, don't have uh, you know, the broadband that we know that they need. And the coronavirus pandemic has caused economic upheaval for millions of Americans, particularly black Americans 
And so the emergency broadband benefit giving low income families $50 discount on their broadband bills and a deeper discount on a device can be life changing for households across the country. But you're right, the program is only temporary. We need to work to effectuate uh, a permanent affordability solution. And you know, the fact of the matter is that we need people to know that they can trust these programs. And so that's what EBB and permanent affordability, uh, they really need to rely on people in the community. Community partners, schools, churches, libraries, all have to remain uh, engaged in the way to spread the news about these programs, about the emergency broadband benefit, about Lifeline. And the last thing that I'll say is I saw a couple of examples of these community partnerships when I took a Southern tour across Alabama and Georgia. Uh, on my last trip, frankly, before the pandemic, yeah, I was in rural Randolph County, Georgia, uh, over two and a half hours away from Atlanta. I saw Stacey Abrams organization there, Fair Count, which was utilizing trusted spaces like barbershops to install internet service for community members to participate in the online census and also get jobs. And then I stopped in Selma, Alabama and visited the Selma Housing Authority to discuss an initiative that they had there bringing free broadband and tablets to children in low-income housing, the George Washington Carver homes in particular. And I'll never forget hearing from a mother of three who said that her life was transformed by the program. She completed her online assignments for her degree program to help her get a job, help her children complete their homework without trips to that local library uh, where they would otherwise have Wi-Fi access. And so that is broadband for the people. Thank you so much, Commissioner Starks. You've painted a vivid picture about how important a broadband subsidy program is for Americans who need access to the internet. I just wanna remind our audience members, if you have any questions for panelists, please drop it in the Q&A and let us know who you are and your affiliation. I wanna turn it over next to former FCC Chairwoman Clyburn. Former Commissioner uh, Clyburn, you spent nearly nine years at the Federal Communications Commission working on these issues. Can you tell us how you think the FCC should be working with ISPs, ISPs to ensure Americans, specifically low-income Americans in rural communities, get connected and remain connected to broadband? Well, Dr. Harrison, thank you uh, for uh, having me. We're a little bit more formal today, uh, Dominique, um, but um, I, I really want to uh, set the stage um, for, for my brief remarks um, at what you do and how you, meaning the Joint Center, has been um, incredibly helpful. I see ourselves at this intersection of broadband opportunity and hope. And I set it up that way uh, because what this pandemic has made especially clear is that broadband, its availability, access, and adoption is a social determinant of health, education, uh, educational attainment, civil engage, civic engagements, economic opportunities, and more. And it is being noticed, and it's being noticed at a time of uh, a time that's most critical. There's no sector of our economy, there's no aspect of our lives that's untouched or not impacted by broadband connectivity or the lack. Uh, of it. Now, we may disagree on many things, but here is, is the undeniable when you talked about some of those figures. More than 31% uh, of uh, rural Americans compared to 4% of their urban counterparts, more than 31% of them do not have access to high-speed uh, internet. And according to uh, another uh, think tank in the, uh, in the DC metropolitan area, if you were to look at uh, the forms, FC, the FCC has a form 477, uh, which looks at deployment. It has data. Um, and if we, they looked at back in 2014 and 27% of the pe of people of color lived in unserved areas or broadband desert. Uh, and if you were to look at those broadband deserts, the lack of, um, uh, of availability of high speed or access to the internet, what you will find is about 33.8% of African-Americans also live in poverty. So the issue is there is a direct uh, correlation. Um, this is a determinant of, of a lot of critical, uh, you know, again, where we are uh, critically, 
And so the FCC's mandate, I believe, is, is more important than ever before. And its mandate, for those who don't know it, is to ensure that advanced telecommunication services are being deployed to every one of us, regardless of where we live or how much money we make, in a reasonable and timely fashion. Um, too many of our areas have been shortchanged. So here is, is what I believe. Um, if you believe that uh, broadband is a social determinant when it comes to addressing unmet needs, then we should push for the FCC to revamp that lifeline program the commissioner talked about. It has been starved for a number of years. It has been demonized for even more years, but it is critical in helping to bridge the affordability gap for so man, many who cannot even afford a dial tone, let alone um, you know, broadband. Because what is clear, um, even though a lot of us are for our uh, proponents of the emergency broadband benefit becoming permanent, there is no guarantee. So the Lifeline program is that lifeline for those um, who have issues when it comes to uh, affording a communications a service. We should not be arguing uh, about the FCC when it comes to its rules and regulations being targeted, um, that being more enhanced, uh, pushing those companies that get almost $9 billion on a regular year to deploy broadband uh, enabled services to our communities, that they should, that should come with conditions. Um, our goals and objectives when it comes to connect, connecting our communities with fast, reliable, affordable broadband service, you know, that should be a part of the equation before you get the next dollar. The FCC should work closely, uh, more closely with or, uh, other agencies like HUD, HHS or the FERC because they're attempting to narrow gaps too. And so the, the bottom line is there's no sector of our economy, including government, uh, including the needs of people um, that cannot be enhanced uh, with safe, reliable, fast, affordable uh, broadband services. So strengthening these partnerships, both state, local, uh, government, uh, philanthropic, uh, amplifying uh, the refrain for competition in our communities because too many of our communities have two or fewer uh, uh, broadband providers and we, there's two or fewer, that means there are uh, fewer opportunities, higher costs, and, and, and fewer options, uh, we should start at the auction design at the FCC, meaning who can participate uh, in these auctions where there could be yet another competitive provider that could offer the next greatest thing. Right now, the way it's set up, only the big guys um, have a, a, the, the best opportunity to win. That means small innovators um, might not have a chance and they may be the ones that hold the key uh, to connecting our communities. So in short, um, the FCC should ensure that every single dollar uh, goes to um, areas of need. Uh, they should make sure that uh, every single dollar is meeting the needs and objectives that we have in terms of connecting our communities affordably uh, and with robust services that they would need to uh, be able to participate and improve their lives in the 21st century. These dollars um, should flow. Yes, they should, but they should come with conditions. They should come with robust conditions uh, and um, uh, accountability to me is key and meeting our goals and objectives of a connected community. So, so areas and individuals can thrive where the indigenous or the, uh, the infrastructure that they have in place or their environments that might be lacking uh, from an educational standpoint, from a healthcare standpoint, for an economic empowerment standpoint, broadband is the greatest equalizer I know when it comes to addressing unmet, unmet needs. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner Clyburn. You've brought up a lot of important topics and especially issues around um, economic well being. I mean, you're from South Carolina and clearly you are very passionate about the challenges and opportunities for rural residents. I'm wondering if you can just provide some insight uh, about what economic opportunities exist in connecting more black rural communities to broadband. 
Well, it, it's interesting. I hate to answer a question in a negative, but it's what app, uh, opportunities that do not exist. Um, just by the very nature of, of rural communities, there's, there's usually less infrastructure by way of transportation and other opportunities. Um, we know um, that uh, uh, we talked about nationally the 16 million um, children or 30% of U.S. students that lacked uh, an inter uh, internet connection when the pandemic hit and they could not um, you know, go to school in person. I could not help but think about uh, my home state, Marion County, South Carolina, where that 30% is well over 50% of the students that didn't have access to broadband. And when I looked at this, you know, research back in 2018, and I know you know it, uh, Dr. Harrison, that showed that just 20% of black students attained the expected level of reading comprehension by the eighth grade compared to 60% of white students. When you see that, and when you see rural hospitals closing and medical professionals leaving the area for greener pastures because the infrastructure is not there. Uh, when you make that link, because it is linked, um, you know, uh, when, when it comes to poor reading um, skills, uh, comprehension skills, uh, poor health outcomes, um, all of that leads to these economic uh, opportunities gaps uh, that currently uh, we're not doing the best job of filling, but I think uh, layered with a, a, a broadband enabled future uh, and a future that, that is not 10 or 12 years away, that if we were to layer and, and, and build as we climb, uh, it broadband into the mix, uh, then a lot of these uh, issues and challenges that we have by way of infrastructure, educational, um, you know, um, the lack of educational uh, opportunities can be buoyed. Um, you know, these opportunities can be buoyed uh, in these areas, rural areas where um, African Americans, um, you know, live. Um, and there are large clusters of African Americans um, who are economically, physically, uh, and opportunity-wise uh, disadvantaged. So to break this cycle, um, uh, I say broadband has to be a part of the mix. And the FCC, going back to my old agency and where Commissioner uh, Starks um, is, is doing well, it has an incredible role to play, a much different role more critical role to uh, play, and with the bandwidth that Congress will give it, um, it has a critical role to play. Thank you so much, Commissioner Clyburn. Really appreciate it. I want to talk about what's happening at the state and local levels, and so I want to talk to Francello Chillo on the panel. You know, there will soon be an influx of money for state and local leaders to address broadband in their local communities. In our report, we recommend that Southern states prioritize broadband expansion in the Black Rural South counties. Can you talk about the unique solutions you have heard about that have been deployed to address the lack of available broadband for communities? Well, thank you so much, um, not only for having this panel, but I feel like I'm on this panel with uh, tech titans. And so it's really exciting uh, because I feel a little bit like I haven't had the decades of experience uh, as my panelists, my co-panelists, but what I think about all the time is the fact that I run into local leaders who take this home with them. It's at church with them. It's at their kids' schools. It's an issue that they can't run away from. And so there are a lot of things that I wanna make sure that we just touch on. Um, and then I'll expand on what are some of the things that we need to see from local leadership. Um, number one, uh, some of the work that's coming out of your report, specifically talking about digital redlining, and I know that you'll expand on it in the advanced copy. I wanna make sure that we are grounding this conversation in the fact that some of this exclusivity about who has access to broadband is actually by design. Part of this is about literally decades of disinvestment and disinvestment strategies, policies, protocols, practices, and just norms that have been accepted that have started in other industries that have bled into our broadband marketplace. So some of the places that were struggling with maybe getting banks in their areas or healthy food or clean water are seeing the same issue with the 21st century utility broadband. So when we're talking about this, without blame or shame, it's important to ground this in the historical reference that part of this, the issues that we're fighting with the marketplace were there by design and so now we need to be really authentic and upfront about the fact that we need to make room at the table for new voices to be able to contribute to those solutions. And that means being able to acknowledge 
that good ideas, some of the most innovative solutions, some of the best collaborations are gonna come from people that are just as diverse as the communities that they serve. When we're talking about the improving broadband access and adoption in black rural communities, it's not just about improving it for them. It actually improves the local economies and the quality of life for all of the communities that they touch. So when we talk about these issues, I don't want it to seem like we are just focused on improving the quality of life for African Americans. We are looking to empower some of the most disenfranchised voices in hopes that we can replicate some of that success in other communities. Some of your research actually focus, focuses on how the lack of access to broadband impacts education and workforce development. But as Commissioner, former Commissioner Clyburn mentioned, this is something that goes, bleeds into generational wealth, how people actually get their homes valued, how they're actually able to um, participate in a digital economy and also in shaping our democracy. So the work, the cause, the importance of what we're doing, it is the urgency of now. And so when we're talking about it, it's hard for me sometimes when I talk to local leaders who feel like they have been excluded from the table in the policymaking processes, they don't always know where to start. And quite frankly, they don't have the resources to do the ambitious projects that they want. So what it, it is upon all of us to make sure that we're creating pathways for them to actually participate in the policymaking and being able to honor their stories and allow them to tell about their needs, their successes, their challenges in their own words without us reframing or coloring them, but just giving them an opportunity to say, this is what I need and this is how you can help. When we are also talking about the digital divide, I wanna make sure that I highlight the fact that we cannot separate this from our conversations about poverty. Poverty in the United States is a really always a dirty word. It's stained in this idea that if you're outside of the United States and you're poor, maybe you were just born into it and had misfortune, but if you're in the United States and you're poor, it's because you didn't try hard enough. And I wanna make sure that we name that and dismantle that because very often when we are talking about the digital divide, wherever you find the, digital, the poverty, you will find the digital divide. So we know that households that are within $10,000 of the poverty line, are struggling with broadband access, even if they have gigabit infrastructure outside of their front door. So what are we doing to make sure that they not only get that first subscription and hold on to it during the promotional time, but that they are able to maintain it, a robust and reliable connection in a sustainable way, and that they also have the digital preparedness and the generational digital literacy in their homes to be able to use those computing devices. So I think that it's really important when we're talking about those things to be able to say all of these obstacles are going to take more than just one agency or one group actually tackling it. There is a part for everyone at this table. At the local level in particular, uh, over the past year, Next Century Cities, we specifically focus on supporting local leaders who are working to improve broadband access for all of their residents. Very often, they are tasked with coming up with immediate solutions, but very often, don't always know where to get in line for resources. So when resources are coming out of federal, uh, federal budgets, very often the places that always get in line know where to sign up and the places that are locked out, many of them in the Black rural South, are not going to know where to sign up. So that means that we need to be aggressive in our outreach and making sure that we're reaching out to people outside of our orbit and that we also need to be able to meet them with language that actually meets where they are because too often tech policy circles are actually designed to be exclusive by saying that you don't have enough tenure or you didn't get anointed by the right group to be blessed with good ideas. And what we need to be able to acknowledge is that there are brilliant solutions happening across the country that are far outside of Washington, DC. The Merit Consortium in Michigan is a great example of where you have scholarship, local grit, and also local leaders who are working together to create broadband solutions. In Washington, of the state of Washington, you actually have in uh, Mount Vernon, you have a mayor who actually has signed up to give other mayors support when they are coming up with their own broadband plans. In Chula Vista, California, they just launched one of the first of its kind digital equity plans and actually the other municipalities around them were reaching out for advice. So what we know is that when you have local leaders and community leaders that are empowered, that is something that is contagious and it touches everyone outside of their region. 
Great example of that, look at Lafayette, Louisiana. Lafayette, Louisiana is a place that 10 years ago asked their incumbent providers to actually improve the quality of service. When they couldn't get what they needed for their residents, they decided to go it alone. And it wasn't just that they're serving the people within their city limits, they are now serving as a role model example for other people in the county and helping other people just across their city borders. So I offer these things as examples because there are hundreds of them and there are also countless communities that have no agency in this conversation. So I encourage everyone who is on this webinar, not just the people on this panel, to make room at your table for new voices because there is genius, there are great ideas and there are all sorts of thought leaders far outside of our orbits now. Thank you so much, Francella, for you know really making it plain and painting a pictures of what local leaders are doing to connect more communities. You know, in the same vein, I just love to hear your thoughts on what you're hearing from them in terms of what they need from Congress to connect more residents. Uh, usually, I will admit one of the first things people are asking for are resources. Um, that is something that unequivocally um, municipalities do not have the resources to launch the types of programs that they uh, that they need. One of the things that we do encourage local leaders as they are starting their broadband plans to make sure that their financial uh, assessments are not only just capturing what falls into a balance sheet, but we're actually thinking about the human capital and the potential partnerships that exist in their area. During COVID in particular, we have a host of local leaders that actually partnered with uh, local providers of all sizes, large, medium, and small, to extend broadband to communities that were either hard to reach or maybe that were um, historically unserved completely. We also know that some of them have actually made inroads in actually being able to do um, ongoing collaborations with schools, because especially in rural areas, um, not only HBCUs, but um, Hispanic institutions, uh, institutions that serve community colleges, indigenous uh, students, there are lots of those um, local communities community college institutions that could actually be a great hub to help expand some of that networking. Thank you so much. Actually, in the larger report, we do talk about the importance of HBCUs, and I'm very excited to, you know, see the ways in which they will partner with local community organizations and Black nonprofits to provide more broadband services and training programs um, for their local community. I want to turn it back over to Commissioner Starks. Um, you know, in our report, we make a recommendation based upon your idea to require providers that receive universal service funds to provide consumers with an affordable option. Can you share more about the importance of this proposal? Yes, it's a great question. Uh, and again, you have to start with the premise that we need to solve a suite of challenges to bring connectivity uh, to folks that find themselves unconnected, uh, and in particular with regard to rural areas that we're talking about here today. And so, you know, I was uh, gobsmacked uh, upon careful study that when we at the FCC pay billions of dollars through our high cost universal service fund to subsidize providers to bring connectivity to areas where the business case won't otherwise do it, that we weren't ensuring that low income folks there were specifically provided for in those build out plans. And so again, you know, I don't have to tell this audience uh, that you can be both poor and rural. And so it makes plain sense. Uh, if the government is going to pay to bring the internet to your community, then it should benefit all the folks in your community and not just the well off. And so I propose that we require mandate that providers that receive universal service fund, high cost funding, provide consumers with an affordable option. Uh, and so this proposal was included in the Accessible Affordable Internet for All Act, led by uh, Whip Clyburn and Senator Klobuchar, as we've heard about. Uh, and, and I'm hopeful that it will make its way into some of the final infrastructure legislation. Uh, but if I can, uh, very briefly, you know, flag, as you mentioned, uh, the importance of HBCUs and, and funding those that seek broadband access, adoption, digital literacy for them and their surrounding communities. And I cannot footstomp enough that proposal. You know, I visited Alabama State University last year, saw that HBCUs can be true partners in bridging the digital divide in the Black rural South. You know, I hosted in a, a number of roundtable discussions with HBCU presidents 
Uh, and in fact, Dr. Harrison, you helped facilitate some of the, uh, one, of the one of those conversations. It's mission critical uh, that the FCC and all of us hear from the Clark Atlanta Universities, Tennessee State, North Carolina A&T, Delaware State I heard from, Howard University. Uh, and, and next time, of course, Mr. Clyburn will try to get South Carolina State uh, in there as well. But really the point is that we're reminded that HBCUs, of course, are unique institutions, play powerful roles in their community and will be vital in achieving our goal of bridging uh, the, unit, the, the digital divide and not only for their students, but across the Black rural South, where, of course, many of those HBCUs uh, are located. Thank you so much, Commissioner Starks. Really appreciate your comments on HBCUs and their importance. Um, I also want to turn it back over to former Commissioner um, Mignon Clyburn. You are also an advocate for greater broadband access and more competition. Can you talk to us about the importance of competition in this entire discussion? I wish I could say to you that um, what I'm about to, to affirm to uh, many is just a rule or an urban problem. But I have seen figures as high as 40% uh, of, of communities. And, and I've heard from you know, people who, got, uh, who live and, and, and have pretty um, expensive homes in pretty urban communities, like parts of DC, where they have few two or fewer options by way of a, a broadband provider. And two is not competition. One is a monopoly and zero you're stuck. Um, and so why we talk about competition a lot as a fuel, uh, as an enabler for opportunities, because uh, where you see competition, you see lower prices, you see higher speeds, uh, you see more product differentiation and, and services. Uh, and, and so uh, when you have that in the mix, when you've got people competing for business, uh, they bring their air game. Uh, and, and so uh, while we talk about competition, that it must be a part of this discussion is that uh, many of the benefits that would not happen organically if we were in a monopoly or a duopoly uh, framework, um, that would not happen and that would not uh, substantially improve uh, the um, you know, options for uh, uh, those particularly in, in rural areas and lack of options uh, that is a, a, a part of, if, if you look at the little asterisk, um, you know, defining rural communities, uh, options, uh, you know, would not be uh, high on the opportunity, um, you know, plate when it comes to them. And so it is a real problem. Affordability is a real problem. Low speeds, a real problem. Um, bad service quality, a, a, a significant problem. Uh, when I went um, down to uh, Jackson, Mississippi, I heard about all three. I heard about people hanging out at McDonald's not to eat, uh, but that was their only affordable, reliable option uh, to do their homework and to fill out that job application. So we've got uh, a, a lot of work to do and competition has to be a part of the enabling mix, both from a legislative and from a regulatory point of view. We've got some disagreements on how to get there and how much money should uh, flow there. Commissioner Starks, um, is experiencing that every day, and I experienced it too uh, during my uh, eight plus years. But we have to talk about it and put it on the table because just providing an opportunity for one is not going to give us as many opportunities as we might think. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner Clyburn. Um, as we note in our report, research from the Free Press shows that you know as communities get higher percentage of african americans in their population they're more likely to have one internet service provider so thank you to speaking about the importance of competition um, in communities um, and so we are coming up to our q a time and so i want to provide um, all our panelists with the opportunity to answer some questions um, that we have coming in for our audiences We've got plenty of questions and I wanna start off with um, this one. And again, any panelists uh, jump in when you would like to respond. Um, Earl Peak with Get Wired America has a two part question. He, or they say that, is there a monitoring mechanism to assure black and minority communities get their fair share of federal funding? And secondly, how can Congress encourage national banks and the Office of the Controller of the Currency to commit credit and capital 
alongside the United States to assure, assure build outs. I'll, I'll take the first part of that. I'll, I'll defer to somebody else who has more expertise, expertise with uh, the comptroller. Uh, but in particular, there are a number of mechanisms that we have at the FCC uh, in particular to make sure with regard to build out now, I'm talking about our high cost program uh, where we are paying universal service fund dollars for build out, making sure that over the course of about a six or seven year life cycle uh, that there are a number of, um, of, of times where they have to hit certain hurdles and they have to continually meet more and more and more folks uh, and get higher numbers and higher threshold numbers uh, in their community that they're continuing to serve. That is not in particularly um, uh, race-based. Uh, where those dollars flow to is part of you know, the Connect America Fund too, which is building out right now the Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, the RDOF that folks may have otherwise heard of. We're going through uh, the long form process right now to make sure that the award winners there are gonna be able to actually build out. And enforcement and, and accountability is something that I deeply believe in uh, as, uh, you know, as, as a former lawyer, even for the FCC. So I'll address it more generically, uh, data. Uh, there's a lack of it. Um, for us to build sp specific programs uh, to address uh, what um, Earl has put forth. Uh, but one of the things that, uh, of the number of things that um, we expressly did uh, during uh, my years at the FCC was to look at areas of need, uh, to look, um, you know, give more uh, credit when it came to auction design. Um, you know, a rural opportunity credit, um, a, a credit that would look at, you know, communities that are economically disadvantaged. There are ways until we get enough data uh, for us to have, um, you know, race specific or more gender specific, uh, you know, initiatives. There are things that we can do. Um, and, and there we, we talked about the economic and the educational gaps that we have. There are creative ways that we can come up with um, that will move the needle uh, in um, communities uh, of color, particularly in, in rural communities. If we look at, look at, you know, Francella, you know, mentioned the long-standing uh, opportunities devised, the long-standing issues of, um, you know, disproportionate uh, rates by way of poverty and, and you know, educational attainment and. Um, uh, economic opportunities and civic engagement. Um, there are ways that we can address those ills, if you allow me to put you know, that label on it, in creative ways uh, through agencies, through programs, through, uh, uh, through banks, uh, through CRAs. When's the last time we talked about CRAs? You know, uh, you know, these are some things that can be you know, collectively done if we coordinate and if we really define uh, public-private partnerships, three P P3s in different ways to really get and move the needle uh, where we have, um, you know, the most by way of challenges. So I, the challenge is, is to be creative, um, to throw it out there, continue, uh, Earl, I know you are, but to, to continue to do so. And um, it is our hope uh, that um, the agencies, particularly collectively, uh, private sector, particularly on their own because they have fewer restrictions, can really put some things in place to make a difference. So when we come back next year, when we look at this, um, you know, in a year, we would have a, a revisit uh, with this panel that we're not talking about the same stats. It would be a shame that our 30 percent here, that link between uh, broadband, um, the lack of broadband and the percentages of, of poverty, um, they seem to be linked. Um, they don't really seem to be linked. Um, you know, they're linked, um, as Francella would say, uh, by a design, intentional or accidental. It doesn't, you know, it, that, that's not the issue here. It is a problem that we must proactively address. Thank you so much, especially bringing back up the idea of poverty. Uh, you know, Omar Woodard had asked uh, of the panelists, how can we build the capacity of county governments, especially persistent poverty counties and rural areas to do this work? 
If I could chime in here, I think it's really important, um, number one, to acknowledge the power of counties. Pa um, counties have an extreme amount of power when it comes to economic development and basically being able to decide what's happening on the uh, municipalities within. Um, and also, you know, when we're thinking about broadband programs that are designed, uh, whether they're in Congress, whether it's the ideation in the White House, or whether it's in a state, you know, a governor's office, we need to make sure that county leaders are actually a part of that discussion. Very often local and county leaders are included as an afterthought. They're actually usually just notified about an RFP or an RFI. We're just letting you know that this money and this is how it's gonna go. And rarely are they actually included in the actual policy making process. So I think it's important for us to be explicit about the fact that they are not only encouraged to participate in that dialogue, but actually individually invited into that dialogue because very often it's not enough for one or two trade associations to to be able to to share what are their struggles there are over 10,000 municipalities across the united states so we need to be able to get a diverse array of them and i'm talking about all the way from guam to puerto rico to hawaii to the outskirts of maine and so we need to be ex like expansive in our reach and also the last thing that i want to say again um, something that Commissioner Starks mentioned about center, um, centering marginalized voices. It is really important voices on the margins. It is really important that we bring them into the center and identify the fact that they are tacti tacticians because they come up with great problem solving all the time on their own and that they actually have good ideas that will improve federal and state policy. If I may, uh, I, I know that a lot of you may be aware but I know that Commissioner Starks and former Commissioner Clyburn are aware uh, that the Affordable Accessible Broadband for All uh, legislation prioritizes persistent poverty counties. Uh, many of you may know I've done extensive work with persistent poverty counties. We now have um, set aside uh, in uh, 21 of our funding bills here for persistent poverty counties. So we focus on that. Secondly, we also uh, mandate uh, by this legislation uh, that uh, local municipalities must be involved in the process. Uh, as you know, uh, in years past, uh, uh, some folks have lobbied at the state levels uh, to deny uh, local communities uh, opportunities to participate. I'm well aware of that. Uh, but I use all of the experiences I've had uh, with creative devices uh, in the South uh, to address legislation, and I use it in this instance as well. Thank you so much for highlighting your legislation, Congressman um, Clyburn. Um, you know, we're coming to, uh, our, our time is coming to an end, and I really want to give each panelist the opportunity to just share some final thoughts on this topic. Um, there's so much more discussion we can have here, but I really want to hear what's on your mind as we continue to think about uh, the bipartisan broadband infrastructure and thinking about helping to close the digital divide for low-income Americans across the U.S. Uh, I'll, well, I'll go first. Oh, oh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Clever. <laughs> well, soon I can get off here and do something else. Thank you guys uh, so much for having me. As you can imagine, uh, things are pretty active here uh, with the Senate trying uh, to wait until the last minute. The House is trying to go home this week. So I am a, a bit busy with some things, but thank you so much for having me. And I'm always pleased to be uh, on uh, with FCC commissioners, uh, present and past because uh, I don't find myself uh, at a loss to disagree with them uh, pretty often. Thank you guys for letting me be here. Thank you, Con Congressman. Well, uh, from um, one, one plier to another, you know, my, you know, one of the things that um, is clear uh, and, and I mentioned that broadband is a social determinant uh, for many of the challenges um, we have the day or the lack thereof. So if we're going to seriously work on breaking this persistent cycle of unrealized opportunities, we must demand certain things. Uh, we must demand accountability from those of the FCC funds. We must demand accountability from state and local uh, leaders that are going to have and will continue to get uh, appropriated money uh, for Congress to make sure that money is more evenly spent 
because newsflash, uh, monies have not been evenly spent um, and opportunities have not been evenly realized. And those uh, that perpetuation uh, seems to happen uh, miraculously in the same places. So uh, again, the demands are great, um, but necessary on us to uh, demand high speeds, high quality, uh, reliability, affordability, and inclusive opportunities because we can talk about and have named a lot of the critical challenges that we have. They're evident, they became more evident uh, during uh, the, you know, this uh, pandemic, th this process, but we're at a unique inflection point where the opportunities are great and leveraging technology and ensuring a more ubiquitous broadband opportunities that are reachable, that are affordable, that are widely available is the key. Uh, that, that, that verb might have should have been, you know, uh, but all of that collectively, they're the key, um, you know, to realizing opportunities and realizing them more quickly. That I believe um, is the difference that, um, you know, the last, uh, you know, pandemic 100 plus years ago, we did not have what we have now. We've learned a lot from that. We need to put those lessons in place in order for us to uh, address these issues, bridge these divides, and expand the opportunity for Horizon uh, through technology. We won't get there quickly without it. Yeah, I would say quickly, um, and it uh, springboards on something that Commissioner Clyburn mentioned as well, and something that I have been speaking about for a while, and something that I'm working on daily here is that we need to make sure, especially for the struggling households that we know have really been hurt through the pandemic, we need to have a whole of government approach to making sure uh, that they are able to get to the suite of, of services that we have for households that are struggling. And so if you are having food insecurity, you are likely having digital insecurity. And so, uh, you know, we need to join with HUD. We need to join with USDA, which controls SNAP. Uh, we need to join with all of our sister agencies and make sure that if you are a part of a struggling household, you don't have to knock on every door in order to get the help that you need. We know that uh, millions of families have recently signed up for SNAP in order to make sure that they have food on the table. We should also be able to get them uh, the connectivity that we know that they all need. And lastly, Francella, do you have any um, last remarks? I'm so thankful for the work of uh, all of these panelists and specifically at Joint Center, keep doing that research. I hope that all of the people who watch this online, especially the people who um, are not often invited into the circle, that there are more people that are more diverse and more good ideas being in, um, basically injected into this conversation. I appreciate you all so much. Again, this conversation deserves so much more discussion, but we wanna be respectful of everyone's time. And our time together is has come to an end. And I wanna say thank you so much to our panelists, Congressman James Clyburn, um, uh, Francella Ochillo, FCC Commissioner Jeffrey Starks, and former FCC Chairwoman Mignon Clyburn. I wanna tell our audience, thank you so much for being here as well please check out our forthcoming report, Affordability and Availability, Expanding, Expanding Broadband in the Black Rural South, which you will find online at jointcenter.org. Thank you for everyone for tuning in.